scrolling, that can really be demotivational to typing um, because they may not be sure how to spell something. So they take these really cool words and ideas they have in their head and they shrink them down and they shrink them down and they make them simpler rather than getting out what it is they have in mind. So something that um, students can use if you're inside of uh, Google Docs, if you go up to the tools menu, there's an option called voice typing. Now, again, I'm in the Chrome browser. I cannot guarantee this works in every browser. Uh, so I am using Chrome at the moment. Uh, so I can guarantee it does work in that. It is possible that some of the other browsers may not support all the features of that. But if I go to tools and voice typing, what I get is this little pop-up microphone here. And if I click on that microphone, the first time you do, it'll ask for permission. But if I click on this microphone, it'll start listening to what I say and start typing it. So we'll try that out. Now that I've clicked on the microphone, anything I say will be typed into the document, period. This is a fantastic tool to allow students to get their ideas out if they struggle with typing or spelling, period. And so as simple as that, I can just talk and it will you know, type up what I say. There are certain things you can say in addition to the words you heard me like mentioning the punctuation. Uh, you can say period and question mark and things like that. If you're not sure what all you can say, if you hover above the microphone, there's a little question mark in the bottom right corner. If you have a click on that, it'll open up a little help menu and they have all the details here for all the different punctuation you can add as well as different commands you can give it, telling it to select text and you know bold things or enter a new line or things like that. Um, you can also do this in different um, accents and languages as well. So if you're typing in a different language, you can um, choose that language here. And this can be a great way to also practice fluency to see how, how well you can speak French or German or Spanish. Or if you are speaking English, keep in mind they do have a lot of varieties of English. So if you're from India or from Australia, um, your, your English accent uh, may be a little different than what we would traditionally think of as a US English accent. And by choosing those different variations, the artificial intelligence built into uh, voice typing will do a better job of, of correctly um, um, typing up what, what you say. Uh, so this, I've seen this tool be just uh, such a powerful thing for students who, um, were just frustrated with you know trying to type up an, an essay and having all these great ideas that they couldn't get out and they switched over to using voice typing and yeah you may have to go back through and clean a few things up and yes you do need to be somewhere where it's not noisy so you might have to you know step out of the room or go to a spot where it's a little quieter to be able to do this um, but a really powerful tool now the biggest drawback would just be the fact that it'll, that that tool works in docs it doesn't work in other places. Um, so um, if you're in Docs, that's great. <laughs> if you're not in Google Docs, certainly you could always open up a Google Doc, talk into it, then you could just go in and copy and paste into other, other um, tools. Having said that though, there are some other options for speech to text besides uh, voice typing. Um, and one of them that I would recommend is a Chrome extension called Voice In Voice Typing. And that is also linked in in the agenda there, Voice In Voice Typing. Now I'm gonna go ahead and turn this one on. Um, I do have all these installed. I just have some of them turned off because you get too many running at once. Extensions can slow things down. So just for clarification, I do have an extension to manage my extensions. That is correct. I'm using an extension called Extensions Manager. So I'm going to come in here and check or uncheck the extensions I want to activate. So I've got all of these installed. I just don't want them all running at once. So I'm going to come here and click on voice in voice typing to reactivate it. And now this little microphone button is up here. That extension is now turned on. Um, so what I can do now is let's say maybe I'm filling out a uh, quiz. Now this obviously is not a real quiz here. I'm just using this as an example, but it's a Google form, but let's say maybe this was, was a quiz. Um, well, because I want to be able to type my answer in here, but it's not a Google Doc, I couldn't use you know, voice typing. Instead, with voice in, voice typing installed, that extension, I can simply right click inside of the box and I can say start recording or I can click in the box and then I can go up and click on the extension. Either way is fine. And then I'll have to click on it again to turn it off. Let's try it out. This is just a test. And there we go. 
and it typed that in for me. And so that'll work on any kind of web page that has any sort of a text box that you can type into. So if you're on a website, voice in voice typing can be a really good option. Um, it also works in other tools like, um, I think uh, somebody asked me the other day, can you use this in Google Sheets? And uh, I believe we were successful in that. Uh, we went to Google Sheets, we double clicked inside of a box. Just testing. And there we go. And it filled that in as well. So, you know, it can be used in a lot of different tools, um, whereas Docs voice typing at the moment um, only works in Docs or um, I, I don't know. I'm not actually now I'm drawing a blank. If it does show up in any of the other ones, um, it, it might show up in a few other spots here and there as Google starts to expand it out. But right now it is Docs voice typing. Um, so between those two, you're in pretty good shape to be able to um, get you know, whatever you say, you know, typed up. Now keep in mind, you can also um, uh, use these in combination. So, you know, here I am uh, pretending to take a, uh, a quiz. So what if this, you know, this was a quiz? Well, I just used voice in voice typing to type in here, but I could also use something, you know, like uh, read and write to, you know, read this aloud for me. And so I could have it read aloud using read and write. So I could hear the quiz read aloud to me. I could zoom in and out, which I've been doing a couple of times in Google Chrome, the control plus or minus key will zoom you in and out. So students could make something larger using control plus and minus. And then um, using a tool like voice in voice typing, they could then um, speak their answers. So that's a, a neat thing to consider is using a lot of these tools uh, in combination with each other. Now outside of that, if we're still in the range, the realm of speech to text, there's a lot of other things here. But the last thing I'm going to mention is that Google has really made a big push recently to do um, uh, live captioning. And so we first saw this inside of Google Slides. If you're running a slideshow, there's a uh, closed captioning button you can click so that while you're speaking, it'll live transcribe everything you're saying. So I could probably demonstrate this um, real quick. Uh, let me go ahead and I'll just go to my drive and I'll just grab a uh, sample slideshow here. I'll grab like my GEG Ohio slideshow here from, uh, whoops, try that again, Eric. G-E-G Ohio, there we go. Um, I'll just grab a quick slideshow here and show you what that looks like. Um, but Google has been working on, there we go, what is G-E-G Ohio? They've been working on building this feature into all of their products. So if I come here and I go to present the slideshow and I go down to the bottom where the black bar is and I click on the captions button, now, as I'm talking, everything I'm saying is being live transcribed onto the screen. This would be, again, a wonderful way for a student to be able to read along with what I'm saying because it's going to listen to everything I say and it's going to transcribe that onto the screen. I can then click on the closed captioning button again to turn that off. So that type of technology, we're seeing it show up in a lot of things now. And one of the ones that I think is, is really neat is a, um, an Android app called Live Transcribe. Now this one I would have to show on a mobile device, so I won't be able to actually demonstrate it right now, but I'll explain uh, what it does. Basically, uh, it is just a, a mobile app, so you could have this running on your phone. And all you do is basically hit the, hit the uh, button and uh, anything that is spoken it will type it up on the screen for you so you could you know have that in class in the corner of your desk and as the teacher is speaking you could see everything they're saying uh, be live transcribed for you at that time so that's another really awesome use of uh, speech to text that allows you no matter where you go in life just to be able to have anything transcribed for you automatically all right, so that's a uh, collection of some of the um, speech to text tools that uh, I would definitely like to recommend for folks. I'll pause there for a moment as well, uh, like before, and see if we have some questions or comments on either the earlier things, text to speech, or some of these speech to text tools. Well, there is a question in texting. Um, any plans on to add translation to the caption, f caption features? Do you, know, do you know of anything like that? Well, not that I have heard of, but I don't see why that wouldn't, you know, make sense because, I mean, you can do that 
to a degree already using um, the Google Translate mobile app. It would just be a matter of them taking that technology and combining it with something like the live transcribe. Um, if you haven't used um, the uh, Google Translate, Google Translate, oops, Translate, um, uh, and I'll just pull up the Android app here. Um, so the Google Translate app for iOS or Android um, is, is really powerful. Um, you know, it does allow you to, um, you know, have a conversation with somebody and have it uh, translate live, you know, so while you speak, it then translates into the other language and they speak and it translates into your language. Um, and um, it's, the, it's the type of app that also you can like point it at a, uh, at a sign in another language and it'll actually live change the text on the sign inside of your phone so you can see what it looks like. Um, and um, it also works offline, which is, which is great. You can just download the languages um, onto your phone. So at the moment, yes, uh, that technology does exist inside of the um, uh, Google Translate mobile app. It would just be a matter of combining that um, with some of these other apps that we have, uh, like the Live Transcribe app. Um, and um, I think uh, absolutely that seems like that would be something we're going to see more and more of. And that's what we're seeing is Google starting to bake this sort of tool into a lot of their different products. And then there was, uh, there's been a couple questions about the link to the document that has all the resources in it. Absolutely. And um, I was struggling to find it. Okay, thank you. There you go. Yeah. So um, probably like I said the easiest way to get there would be to head to my blog, which is at www.controlaltachieve.com. Once you get to the site, if you put a slash sped on the end of the address, it'll jump you specifically to the page that has all of the resources. The very first link on that page is the session agenda document. So that link will get you to this page on accommodations. And I add new things to this frequently. And right here you have the session agenda that we are working through right now. Thank you for uh, mentioning that. Yes. The way people can get to all of the resources um, and follow along with that. Excellent. Well, the next section we're going to take a look at is going to be readability. Um, but before I move on to that, anything else at the moment? And again, if people have examples where they've used these in classes, uh, that would be great to if you could put it into the group chat or if you unmuted yourself and and came aboard. I see, Randy, you're currently unmuted. Do you, do you have a question or comment? Oh, no, sorry. Oh, no, that's fine. That's fine. I just, if it, if you did, I wanted to give you a chance. I'm, I'm sorry to call you out. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to keep on uh, moving. Oh, forward. look, and Tammy. Okay. Tammy's used text-to-speech for struggling writers and it's life-changing. Absolutely. And that, to me, that's why we teach, is, is when you see a kid who's struggling and all of a sudden you do something and that kid starts shining, that's yes. the feeling that we all love. Absolutely. And then there's a question um, from C. Stearns. Can any of the speech-to-text programs work in some special programs such as uh, SPED Medicare billing programs? Um, so that would be more of a challenge if those programs are something that are not browser based. You know, if it's, um, you know, a, a separate program than something that's running inside of your web browser, because what we're looking at here um, are all cloud based web based tools. Now I know there are certainly installable tools like on a Windows computer or Mac computer. You think of things like um, uh, Dragon or programs like that that can be installed locally on the computer that might be able to interface with some other tools. Um, so I guess my quick answer would be if it's in a browser, I'd be optimistic that you know one of these tools will be able to work with it. Um, if it's not a browser-based tool, not necessarily, um, because right, those you know are going to be outside of the reach of a extension, a Chrome extension. 
Great questions. Keep them up. Thank you. All right. Well, the next thing we're going to talk about is what I'm in general just calling ability. Now, what I mean by that is being able to um, read what is on a web page by uh, reducing distractions or by making the text into uh, a format that is easier for a student to be able to read. And there's a lot of them in this category. Um, I'm going to take a uh, a quick look at a, a couple of them a little closer and then just sort of mention others and explain what they do. I have all of these installed though, so I will be happy to, if somebody says, oh, hey, let's actually dig into one of those, I'll be happy to go ahead and activate it up here from my extension list and try them out. Uh, this whole list again, of course, is all bulleted here um, under readability in our agenda. So the first one that I'm gonna demonstrate is one called Mercury Reader. Now, this is a type of extension. There's a bunch of them like this. This is just one of the cleanest and easiest to use of this. It's an extension that basically cleans up a web page, so it makes it easier for a student to be able to read it. So I'm going to head back over to Dogo News, uh, and again, things, it's a great website. I don't mean to be picking on Dogo News in any way, but it is a pretty busy, active site. There's some advertisements. There's popular articles. Um, there's things like... Uh, uh, comments at the bottom, you know, there's, there's a lot going on on some of these pages here. And we may find, you know, that true with, with some sites where they're, they're busy, they're, and there's a lot of different links and things that, that could be distracting. Well, if you have Mercury Reader installed, which I do, it gives you this little rocket ship icon way up here in the top corner because uh, there's where the extension is. And all I have to do is from my article, go up and click on Mercury Reader. And what it does is it reloads the article and it cleans up everything from the page and only leaves the article and the images behind. So the ads disappear, the comments disappear, the you know, other links that you know, could be distracting disappear, and you just get this nice, clean, easy to read article uh, left behind. There is a little gear in the top here you can click on. If you prefer a dark theme versus a light theme, or if you wanna change the font, or if you want to change the size of the text as well. Um, and again, we can combine things. So I could use, you know, read and write along with this if I wanted to clean it up and then have something read aloud, for example. Now, this is not the only tool that does this sort of thing. There's a lot of these cleanup type tools, but Mercury Reader is definitely a, a nice and easy to use uh, version of that type of a tool. Um, other things that fall into this readability category, and again, I won't demonstrate every one of these, but they are all installed, and just let me know if you want me to fire one of these up and take it for a spin. We've got tools like Open Dyslexic and Dyslexia Friendly, which are extensions that can be used to change the font on web pages to a font that may be a little bit easier to read. There is a font called Open Dyslexic that has a heavier weight to the bottom of the letters and helps keep them oriented a little bit better for, for readers. Um, and then Dyslexia Friendly does the same thing, but it also includes the Comic Sans font, which uh, there's been some, um, some research into that as to could that be a font that's a little bit easier to read if somebody is struggling with um, some of these reading difficulties. Uh, so those can be um, turned on. Uh, there's another really cool extension called Beeline Reader, and it does a lot of the same things the others do. It can clean up a web page, you know, strip out the ads and strip out things like that. But the thing that I think is really kind of nifty that it does that the others don't do is this color gradient. And so what it does is it changes the color of the text as you move from left to right, to make it easier for the student to find the next line they're supposed to be on. So when I get to the end of the line, I'm on bright blue. Well, I wanna start back up with bright blue on the next line or bright red to bright red, just so I don't get lost going from line to line. Now this one again, like some of them, does have a free and a paid version. The free version limits you to five articles a day, but that's still pretty nice. If you had a couple articles that a student needed to read, this could clean them up and throw in that color gradient to help them uh, stay on the right line. Uh, AT Bar is an extension that also gives you a floating toolbar, kind of like Read and Write, and it does a lot of the same kind of things. It does one thing, though, that's different that I have not seen any of them do, and that's color overlays. So I don't know if you've ever 
been in a situation where in the in the physical world uh, we'll have students take a colored transparency and put it on top of a page that they're reading. For some students, reading through that color makes it easier for them to be able to read. Well, ATBAR mimics that in a digital sense. You can have a yellow, red, green, blue, uh, opaque overlay uh, digitally, you know, put on top of a web page or on top of what you're reading on the computer. And um, if that's something that's beneficial um, uh, for students, it could certainly be something to try out here with the ATBAR extension. Magic Scroll Web Reader basically takes a big, big, big article and breaks stuff into little chunks. <laughs> so it basically makes a flippable ebook out of an article. And the idea behind this would be, instead of having a student be overwhelmed by, oh my goodness, this is such a large article I have to read, they can just flip through page by page and just read a chunk at a time. And you can, of course, adjust the font size and, and so forth um, on that as well. Uh, Readline is actually an extension designed for speed reading, which sounds a little counterintuitive here, but what you can do is you can slow the word per minute rate way, 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 way down, and then when you highlight some text and, and turn on Readline, what it'll do is move one word at a time very, very slowly, or the students can use the arrow keys to move forwards and backwards through the words, allowing them to focus one word at a time as they're reading. Uh, visor um, allows you to darken most of the screen except for a bar that is lit up and then you can move that up and down to be able to focus on the part of the texture reading. High contrast can be very helpful for students that have a difficulty reading things on a really bright white background. Um, it allows you to change to a bunch of different preset um, uh, color contrast um, options and uh, of the different ones that do change the colors on pages, I found high contrast to really be easy to use and it works really well. Um, color Enhancer, this is designed for folks who are partially colorblind. The idea is to identify um, which color scheme is the easiest to view and then it makes adjustments to web page colors to try to, um, to, to mimic that so that it's easier for people who are partially colorblind to be able to make out the content on web pages. Uh, next up, Crafty Zoom is a, an extension that gives you a floating magnifying glass. I know earlier I mentioned you can magnify the entire page by pressing the control plus and minus keys, or on a Mac, probably command plus and minus, that will zoom you in and zoom you out. Crafty Zoom just gives you a floating magnifying glass so that you can drag around and just magnify portions of the page. So that's a big collection of readability tools. And like I said, given, you know, if we have time, we can move into some additional, you know, topics here. There's a, uh, there's other groups of uh, extensions we can take a look at, but I threw a bunch at you there all at once. If anybody has any questions on any of those um, or a suggestion for how you have used these or a suggestion for one that I overlooked, um, let me pause for that. There, there was a great question. <laughs> um, well, they're all questions have been great, but this one kind of hit me because what do you do if you want to push out some of these tools to lots of students? How do well, you sure. manage that? Yeah, so we really haven't talked a whole lot about the technical end behind this tonight, but I'm more than happy to pause for a moment and mention that. So first of all, most of these tools I've been showing are what we call Chrome extensions. And so in each case, there is a page in the Chrome Web Store where you can find each of these extensions. If you're not familiar with the Chrome Web Store, it's basically like the you know, Apple App Store or the Google Play Store for your phone, except this is for your browser, the Chrome Web Store. And the Chrome Web Store can be found at, let me go ahead and pull this up here for you here. It can be found at chrome.google.com slash web store. So in a perfect world, you know, you just go to chrome.google.com slash web store and you can install whatever extension you find there. Chances are those schools probably do not have that enabled for their students because if you go to the Chrome Web Store, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of extensions. And there's some really great ones. But there's also some that are not necessarily educational. And a student could come in here and install a whole bunch of these. And if you get too many installed at once, it can really slow down your computer. So a lot of times schools will do 
is they may turn off that feature so that students cannot install them themselves. Um, and so that really brings up the question, so how do you get these out to the kids? Well, one thing that you can do is you can use your, um, your G Suite admin console. So um, for those who are administrators of your Google domain, you can log into your ad admin console, and from there you can control all sorts of things, including things like pushing out Chrome extensions. Uh, now they have moved things around here recently. I think now, oh, where have they put the Chrome extensions at now? They did just rearrange things here. Um, I'll head into my Chrome management. And that was just to make things interesting, right? Yeah, but it's it's fine. So if you dig a little bit into device management, Chrome management, then apps and extensions, what you can do is you can come here and you can choose for your whole domain or for specific organizational units. You can say, I want to install, and you can choose, I want to install something from the Chrome Web Store, for example. And then you can come here and you can find, you know, an extension that you might want to install. So if I wanted to, you know, do something like Mercury Reader, I could come in here and type in Mercury Reader. And once it finds that, I could select that and I could add Mercury Reader to a group of students. So I could say all middle school students or all fifth grade students or all the students that I've moved into a certain organizational unit are going to get this extension automatically. And so by doing that in the admin console, um, what will happen is when every student logs into a Chromebook, or when they sign into their Google account inside of Chrome on a Mac or a PC, the extensions will automatically be installed. Uh, they do not need to go to the Chrome web store and install them themselves. They just boop, 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 boop. They just show up there as installed extensions. And if you have pushed out the extensions, the students can't uninstall those. Those will say installed by administrator, so they wouldn't be able to remove them. Um, now, in addition to forcing them out like that, you can also go in and just say, these are the extensions that we are going to approve. So, um, you know, out of the thousands of extensions out there, here's 25 that we've decided to approve. And then the students could install those themselves, but just the ones that you've approved. Now, of course, all of this is contingent upon you being the a person with access to your G Suite admin console. So if or that's friend, you, or friendly. You need friendly to talk person, to right? yeah, <laughs> you need to talk to your G Suite administrator or administrators, whoever the tech people are in your district that are managing that. And how does one vet privacy for Google extensions? That was another interesting question. And my guess is you're going to be talking about this more extensively at FEDC in your you know in your admin sessions, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, um, and I'm always happy to get into any of those type of questions. Certainly, buyer beware, even though these are free, you're not really buying anything. I think you do need to do your due diligence. And so if you are, you know, doing something like, again, Mercury Reader, um, any extension that you're going to install, if you go into the Chrome Web Store, what you'll notice are some things such as reviews. So you'll see how many users there are. There's uh, over a million users, it's got a four star review. The reviews tab will give you uh, people's reviews and you're gonna need to look through and get a, a sense out of those. You're gonna see you know, a variety, but if there's a problem, oh my gosh, it's gonna come to the top pretty quick. You're gonna find out if people are noticing that there's an issue with this. Um, Chrome extensions, you know, can't, can't really get away with stuff for too long before people notice if there's an issue with it. Having said that though, you can also follow the links in here to the website associated with that particular extension. And that will allow you then to also look at things like their terms of service, you know? So, you know, what does it say? Is this allowed to be used with students under the age of 13? You know, what, what is the end user um, agreement, you know, for that? Uh, so every extension has to have a link that will take you out to their web page where then you you know should be able to and if it's you know i mean any any tool out there needs to have you know somewhere there's going to be an faq there's going to be something here if i poke around i'd be able to get in and take a look like here's mercury reader and um i don't know i'd have to dig around a little bit here but i would want to be able to find the uh the, the license agreement you know for that to see even though it's free um i'd want to find out uh, more information about it. And I think it's been established by the Supreme Court that if Eric Kurtz says that the, the application <laughs> is good, that you're, you know, you're fine, right? 
No, I always want to teach, you know, it's the old thing about, you know, teach, teach a man to fish thing. You know, I, I always want to show people, mm. please do your, take your time, do your research, look at the reviews. Uh, and maybe look at Common page. Sense Media also. Common Sense Media, I cannot recommend enough. It is such a wonderful, wonderful resource. Um, what, no, no matter what it is you're reviewing, um, whether it be, you know, traditional media, movies, TV, things like that, or whether it be uh, technology tools. Yes. Absolutely. Well, I'm looking at the time. So we have um, about seven minutes. So sure. I was thinking uh, out of the um, 200 tools that are left, <laughs> uh, uh, what would, you know, if you really wanted somebody to be impressed, what would you, what would you choose? Well, I mean, there's a lot of awesome things here still. Um, I would say, let's go ahead and head into the next category and just uh, grab a couple things out of reading comprehension. Um, and so the idea behind this is, okay, so I used a readability tool to be able to read what's on the page, or I used, you know, a, a text to speech to hear it. But what if I don't understand what it is that I read? And so these are some tools that can help with comprehension. Things like Google Dictionary. This is an extension. I think I do have it turned off at the moment, but I can turn it back on very quickly here. And Google Dictionary basically allows you to double click on any word on a web page and get it defined for you as well as pronounced. So if I have Google Dictionary installed and I'm not sure what, you know, the word feast means, I could double click on it, it'll pronounce it and it'll tell me it's a large meal, typically one in celebration of something. And so the idea behind this is this is giving power to students while they are um, reading to be able to get information, uh, to get additional assistance uh, just by double clicking on a, a word. Now there's other, obviously, you know, certain ways that many other things we can use to help with, with comprehension, uh, but this just gives one more tool in that, uh, uh, that uh, toolbox. Some other ones that are useful are tools that do summarization. So there's summary, there's TLDR, resumer, internet abridged, auto highlight. All of these are tools that will take take an article and then using artificial intelligence, try to figure out the most important sentences in there to give you a briefer summary of that. So for example, I believe um, I've got this one installed already. Uh, summary, there is one click summary. So let's say I head back over to this one on Thanksgiving and I give a click on my summary tool. And what it does by default is it picks, I think, seven sentences, I believe is the default for this, but you can change that. And what it's doing is it's reading through the article and trying to identify the seven most important sentences. Well, usually it is. Of course, I picked it now. Oh, there it is. <laughs> it was a little slower there tonight than I thought it was going to be, but it, it, it came up just fine. And so here you have a seven sentence summary of that article. Now, that doesn't mean the student shouldn't read the whole article, but this might give them the gist and allow them to really focus in on the key things they want to get from that article. And of course, you can change the number of sentences and it will adjust that as well. There are quite a few um, of these, and again, you can just go through and try the different ones to find one that, um, that you like best. If you do have, by the way, if you do have the full version of Read and Write, um, it also has the, uh, a similar tool called Simplify Page that will allow you to strip out everything from the web page and then use this little plus minus button up here to start summarizing it. And every time you hit minus, it makes the article smaller and plus it makes the article bigger so that you can find, uh, so you can read a summary of it as well uh, using read and write. Um, all right. Um, the next thing I would mention in this category, probably one of the last things we'll mention, um, are not really uh, extensions at all. They're just websites, but uh, it's important, I think, to make sure they're on people's radar. And that is websites that provide articles at different lexile levels. I think a lot of people know the, the, the Newzella website. That's a very well-known, very popular one. But think there are other ones as well, like Tween Tribune and ReadWorks and News and Levels. Uh, so like Tween Tribune, for example, I'll pop out there. Um, most of these follow this sort of a pattern where you'll have an article that's written at three or four or five different Lexile levels. So a student can come in and read this article, for example, at a 510 Lexile level. The exact same article has been rewritten at an 800 level and a 1100 
and a 1640. And so either students can use this to find an article at a, to find a, a level of the article that's appropriate for them, or the teachers could assign these articles to the students based upon the level that's appropriate for them. The point being all of the students are able to be reading the same content, but at something that is differentiated specifically uh, for them. So those are a couple of uh, useful ones in uh, reading comprehension. I would definitely encourage you to check out other things that are included in this uh, resource, such as behavior and focus tools like uh, Google Keep, which is a wonderful way for students to take notes and keep everything organized. And then Google Keep integrates beautifully into Google Docs. There's actually a Google Keep icon on the far right hand side of Docs and anything you throw in Google Keep, you can pull into your doc later. Um, Tools like Pear Deck, which are a great way to take a slideshow and make it engaging and interactive so that the students can participate while you're doing a presentation. And they can also see the slideshow right on their device in front of them, making it easier to see as well. Um, and then way down at the bottom of this document, uh, beyond a few other uh, shortcuts and resources I have, I have a whole section on Chromebook accessibility features. So if you are using Chromebooks, there's a lot of tools built right into Chromebooks that don't even need extensions. There's text-to-speech options. Uh, there's things that allow you to be able to, um, you, if you're having a hard time using your mouse to click, you can just hover above links and it will automatically click for you if you hover over there long enough. Uh, having a large cursor or highlighting the cursor when it's moving. Um, lots of really useful tools, an on-screen keyboard. Um, a lot of things like that that can be turned on in the accessibility features of a Chromebook. Now that can be its own whole session <laughs> all on its own, uh, but as far as the tools we looked at, these all do work on Chromebooks as well as on Macs and PCs using the Chrome browser. So I wanted to focus on the most universally applicable tools for what we looked at here tonight. Now, if somebody t t was listening here and, and they said, you know something, I would really like Eric to come out to my school or district and talk to us about what we should be doing. Would you do that? Yeah. Um, so again, my website, controlaltachieve.com, there's a tab called services. And um, if you visit that tab, um, it has some um, uh, information about me, including things such as a, um, a Google Apps training and services uh, document um, that if you give a click on that, it'll bring up a Google Doc showing about 50 or so of my most common uh, training sessions that I provide. Certainly, I'm always happy to customize this to meet the needs of you know, whatever uh, districts are looking for, but sometimes having a, a catalog like this gives them an idea of, oh wow, here's a bunch of things that we can you know, uh, pull from to get some ideas of things that Eric might be able to provide uh, training on or, or keynote sessions or things like that. Uh, so again, yeah, I would just direct people to, uh, again, the, the, the core website, which is controlaltachieve.com. And then from there, you can um, go to my services page. But at the same time, there's a lot of you know, resources and training materials available here that people can just you know, dive into and take advantage of. I've got webinars of my own that I've recorded in the past. All of these are totally free. You can watch it anytime you would like. Um, there's a podcast that I do that goes along with the blog. If you prefer to hear things rather than read them, there's a resources tab where I have all of my help guides and, and templates and projects organized by uh, topic or by subject area and of course the blog itself I uh, every week or so put some new resources on here that you can take and use in your classroom right away as well so definitely feel free to take advantage of the site but of course I would be thrilled and more than happy to uh, come out and visit and work with folks if, if I can uh, be of assistance good and uh, I happen to, uh, if, if you it just give me a chance to share my screen for a second. Sure. Um, I'll stop I, my sharing. I actually, I, I have the page up that lists the sessions that you're doing at FEC, FETC. Okay. And um, let me just move this aside. And I mean, I can't really count that high, but it looks like there's more than three. <laughs> there's, a, there's a few. <laughs> I'll, I'll be busy. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so if you're heading out to FETC, uh, the ones with the dollar signs, I think um, you have those to Those are the workshops. Yeah, yeah the those workshops. are the workshops, yeah. Uh, and then uh, the others are sessions that you can sign up for. Absolutely. And if you, if you enjoyed tonight, um, I encourage you to come to FETC and to, and to see Eric in, in Florida. I'll be uh, 
The dates for FETC are January 14th to 17th. And for the first time ever, this year is in Miami. So yes. it's been in Orlando. So that, that'll be interesting. So I'll stop my share. And, um, and I will say, so Eric, thank you. Absolutely. My pleasure. And uh, yeah, it looks like there's a, a, lot of, um, a lot of people are thanking you. And um, yeah, I probably, uh, uh, just one last question, I guess, is live caption, captioning available in Hangouts? Yes, it is. Okay. They have added, they have that. Yes, they're, they're baking that into all the products. Yes, Google Hangouts does support the same live captioning that Google Slides does. And many of the other Google tools are now embedding that in there. Yes. That's cool. Okay. Well, I'll see you at, um, at FETC. But before then, I hope you have a real a fantastic Thanksgiving. Thanks. And um, we made a, a an archive of of most of this. I think I missed the first five minutes because I messed up. That's but, okay. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm human, um, or subhuman, no one one of the two. No Anyhow. problem. <laughs> um, so, well, thank you, thank you very much, and Mitch Weisberg for EdChat Interactive, and hope to see some of you at the other sessions that we have coming up in December, and hope to see you at FEDC. And good night for Edge Head Interactive.